morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, St. Luke's. We're glad that you are with us today in worship, no matter where you are. May the Holy Spirit bring us closer together. My name is Jen Stiles Williams. It's a privilege to welcome everyone here. We want you to fill out those connection cards, whether you picked up the QR code in the room, whether you see it on the link um, as in the chat. Please fill that out. It lets us know that you're present among us, but it also helps us to understand how we can pray for you or how we can be in ministry with you throughout the week. So please fill that out. Um, and also, if you're watching online, make sure you're ready to give um, with the QR code during our offering time in worship. So today we are excited because we have a special guest with us. So for 40 years here in ministry, we at St. Luke's have supported the United Methodist Children's Home, which is in DeLand, Florida. It's a, a respite place for children who can no longer stay in their homes. And every year for 40 years on Christmas Eve, we have given the entire offering, no matter how many services we have, even when it's on the 23rd, the entire offering goes to children. Sometimes it's children here in our community, but also a large portion of it goes to the United Methodist Children's Home. So to come and tell us a little bit more about it and to give us the kind of uh, total of what we've given for this year, we have Elizabeth Gad, who is the Chief Development Officer from the United Methodist Children's Home. So will you welcome her with me? Thank you, Pastor Jen. And what an honor and a privilege it is to be with you all here today. And what a fantastic setting. Well, like Pastor Jen said, I am from the Florida United Methodist Children's Home, your Florida United Methodist Children's Home, where we have the honor and privilege every day of serving children thanks to your generosity. That includes on our two campuses, both in Enterprise and up in Madison, Florida. That is in foster care across five counties in the state. That's through our community-based counseling program in 10 counties, our independent living and as well as our Early Childhood Education Development Center. So in all, you are helping us serve well over a 1,000 children each and every month throughout the year. And that's part of why I'm here today. Thanks to you and your generosity, I'd like to invite Pastor Jen up and make a special presentation. Once again, in recognition and appreciation, this certificate is presented to St. Luke's United Methodist Church in sincere appreciation for being a top 20 giving church for 2020. I think you all deserve a round of applause for that. So now, would you like to know how much you gave last year? I'm glad you're sitting down. $117,445. Yes, it gives me chills. It is just absolutely amazing. Thank you, Pastor Jen. And if I could take one moment, I want to share just a couple stories. Let's drill that down. How are you making a difference in the lives of our children? Well, let's talk about a young boy, 12, 13 years old, who came to us a couple years ago. Unfortunately for him, his parental rights were terminated, which meant that he no longer could live at home with his parents. And so he was living with us, and he became a little discouraged. He began to lose hope. And of course, what, is, what do we always learn in church? We always have hope in Christ, right? So we worked with him and we encouraged him. And he wanted a family of his own. He so desired to belong and have a family. And so he began to pray and we began to pray with him. And I'm here to tell you today that in spite of COVID and everything it has brought the last year, a family was partnered with him, and he is in the process of being adopted by that family. Isn't that fantastic? And then there's Haley. Haley was with us for two years. Again, Haley was unable to continue to live with her parents. Her, the parental rights were terminated. Thankfully, thankfully for her, her grandparents adopted her. And so she is now 17, a senior in high school. She came back to visit me recently, and I just was so thankful to be able to spend time with her. Well, after she left me, she went to go visit her former house parent, and I had an opportunity to visit with her former house parent when I was up in Madison a couple weeks ago for the board meeting. And she shared with me that Haley brought her a dozen roses just to say thank you for all that she and her husband had done to pour into the life of Haley while Haley was at the children's home. And for me, that story represents a full circle because while Lisa and Joe had poured into Haley and all the other children under their care for the last 10 years, 
here Haley was coming back around to pour into them and say thank you. I hope that gives you just a small glimmer of how you are able to pour into children each and every day. And while the young boy and Haley's stories are complete at the children's home, there are so many more that are still in our care that we are caring for each and every day thanks to your generosity and support. Thank you again. God bless, and we greatly appreciate you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And thank you all for your generosity. I mean, this $117,000, you all gave this during a pandemic. And not only did you give to this, but you gave to our Restoring Hope Fund during Christmas Eve, and you gave to our church. So thank you for your continued generosity and support. This Christmas Eve, we will again be able to give to children here in our area, as well as the United Methodist Children's Home. So make sure that you're ready to offer your gift during the Advent season to the one who gave us the gift of the child. Now let's stand up. Let's turn around if you're in the room, kind of give a nod and a wave to everyone. If you're in the chat, make sure you greet one another and let's worship God as we center our hearts. And Alina leads us in our call to worship. Good morning, good morning, beloved. It is so good to be home. <sighs> Won't you join me in the call to worship? Love calls us to worship as we call ourselves to worship. Let us answer love's call. Love calls from the highest heights and the lowest depths. Let us worship the author of love. Let's do that. Hallelujah. Blink. 
imposible de comprender y me llamas más profundo me llamas más profundo me llamas más profundo al amor al amor es color father es who you are about the presence and the goodness of God. Something about gathering together in his name just to love on him and let him love us back. Won't you join me in this prayer? God who dwells in patience and kindness who is not quick to anger and keeps no record of wrongs Show us what love truly looks like in word and in deed. Awaken our hearts to recognize you as the true lover of our souls. Amen. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I can do to let you down It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud I'll never be more loved than I am right now oh. Going through a storm yeah. But I won't go down I hear your voice carried in the rhythm of the wind to call me you would cross an ocean so I wouldn't drown You've never been closer than you are right now You are a gyro You are enough Gyro You are enough I will all about so stay
Nobody chose you. I know who I am. Man. I know what you've spoken. Whoa. I'm already loved more than I could imagine. And that's more. Dress is a lily with you.
that was not enough. God, you are more than enough. And if we would just learn to be content and settle into your love, God, how much more beautiful and easy and not easy as in not having struggles, but, but, but ease and peace our life would be. Holy God, we come to you in this time of worship and we, we know that your spirit has moved to bring us here, that you were here before we got here, that you were with us in our coming and all the things that have weighed on our hearts and weighed on our minds and kept us from you and kept us discontent. You already know them. You are just waiting for us to surrender and to let them go and to admit and to give it up. Holy God, we ask that we lay bare our souls before you, that we open up our minds, that you would, you would meet us in that place of vulnerability and in that surrender, you would offer us grace and peace and love a little more than we understood before. We ask this in your holy, holy, holy name. Meet us. And in our time of worship, may we fully love you more than anything else. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you to our amazing worship team. And so we're going to ask that if you are in the space, if you want to pull out your app or if you're online, that this is a time that you can present your offering to God knowing that God's spirit was moving in that song and in that love, now give yourself to the Lord um, through your resources, through your presence, through your prayers, and know that you're giving not to the church, but you're giving to the church on behalf of a God who is doing mighty things in this church, through this church, as you just heard about. We're feeding people, we're, we're housing people, we're bringing people the, deeper into a relationship with God and with one another so that they can use their gifts to be incredible agents of grace, public theologians out in the world leading your life and showing the world that there is a God that we surrender to. So we offer our, ourselves, our prayers, our resources to God in this time through our offerings, and we ask God to bless us as we do that, knowing that we are blessing God's kingdom in the world. And now let's watch a little word to prepare us and get us settled into our scripture today, but also our understanding of who the real character of love interest is. Let's watch Lana. Good morning, St. Luke's. It's Miss Lana. I have a question for you. How many of you know what a safe place is? All right, well, a safe place is somewhere you go to when storms rush in. In America, if you live where there are tornadoes, you know that a safe place is somewhere you run to and you probably cover your head. If you live where there are tornadoes, earthquakes, you know where to run to the nearest door frame to stand in so that you can protect yourself from falling items. And if you live somewhere near the ocean, like we do, I'm pretty sure we know in our home or in our schools where we go to when those hurricane winds start. Safe places are meant to protect us from strong winds and destructive forces. God wants to be our spiritual safe place. When life comes at us like a hurricane, we know that we can always run to God to protect us. David ran to God when he felt like the world was against him. After his enemies were defeated, he thanked God in great thanksgiving. And you can read that with your family in 2 Samuel 22. You'll see that every line in that Psalms speaks of God's protection and greatness. David calls God his rock. I wonder if that's because God helped him, you know, with the rocks and Goliath. But in fact, David calls God his rock five times in the Psalms. And when someone says something that many times, you know, not only do they mean it, but it's really important. He called God his rock, his strength, his shelter. And we can call God our rock too. When we feel scared, we know that we can hold tightly to God in those storms. 
and know that at the end of the storm, God is holding us tightly still. So a rock, strength, a shelter, those are words that David used to describe God. And I wonder, what words do you use to describe God? So at this time, we invite our children to head out and go to worship enrichment. Um, they're going to have an opportunity to be with Lana and their small group leaders and have a really good time and understand our scripture and our story even better. But Lana was talking about how God is our protector and our stronghold and, and how much David loved him and understood him. And so uh, the question for us today is who really is the love interest here? So we've moved through all these different characters in our life story. We've understood the heralds in our life stories and the caregivers and protectors and even the antagonizers and the nemesis, which is usually us, our ego, the prophets or fools that come and speak a word of truth. And we've understood them not only in our life story, but seen how maybe we have been playing those roles in others and maybe how God is inviting us to please go into other people's life stories and be that as a word of God and truth. And today we come to what is one of the, the my favorite, because I love a rom-com, right? But my favorite characters, which is often the most undeveloped in movies and stories, which is the love interest. Now, the love interest character is the easiest to explain because it's the one that the protagonist falls in love with, right? But what we don't always understand is that character is the one that actually works to help the protagonist move the plot line of the story along. They're the ones that often creates conflict for the protagonist. And, and they're the ones that often are found in some kind of uh, relationship triangle that, that centers the protagonist on, on who they are and what they believe, but also what they love and what they want from their life. Now, throughout this whole discussion, as we've moved through David's stories and understood David best through these characters that have interacted with his story, we've said that David is a protagonist. So naturally, then our question would be, who is David's love interest? Was it his eight or more wives? I mean, there's nothing really in the scripture that says his wives are his love interest. <laughs> There's some, you know, understanding of, of softness with Abigail, where he invites Abigail after being a, a prophet to him um, to be in relationship and to be his wife. There's moments afterwards with Bathsheba, but mm, I don't think it's the wives. Some ask, is it Jonathan? Is Jonathan his love interest? Which we certainly see that love, however it is full in its fullness and that devotion and that adoration from Jonathan as the protector and caregiver. But the reality is, except for a lament of both Jonathan and Saul, and except for where uh, uh, David goes in, as we talked about, and, and brings uh, Jonathan's son into the table, we don't really hear anything reciprocal back from David. So is it God? Is God actually David's love interest? That's what we've said as the church. That's what we've, we've said. He was a man after God's own heart, which is probably a misread of the word after. The truth is after is, is really talking about according to God's heart. In other words, God's going to look on someone to be the king according to what God believes a king should be. Now, in other places, Old Testament and New Testament, we hear that, that David's ultimate love interest is God. Maybe, maybe not. Some people don't think so, but I think he is. I, I read David as a flawed character just like me. Who, who tries and tries, but, but often is caught up in my own ego, in my own self-regard, in my own interest, and, and I fail as miserably as David does. But then I try to confess, as David beautifully did after Nathan meets him, and through grace I try and try again. How about you? Amen? So the truth of the matter is, even though most of the story that we read in First and Second Samuel and Chronicles, it feels like David's real love interest is David. It is with me too. I'm probably you. 
on any given Monday through Saturday, somebody might say the same, maybe even on Sunday. But that is where the good news of today is. Because maybe, maybe the good news is not how much we are like David and that David is the protagonist and we're the protagonist of our own story, but maybe we need to turn this on our head, just like we did with Lent if you were here. Maybe the true hero of the story, the true protagonist, just like in every story of scripture, and truthfully, in all the ways we understand ourselves as students of Jesus, the real protagonist is God. It's not David. It's not us. It's not any character in the biblical story. It's God, creator, son, and Holy Spirit. This story, it tells us about David. It even tells us about Israel, but, but they are just characters in the larger life story, not just of scripture, but of the entire world that tell us about the characteristics of God. God as creator, God as anointer, God as redeemer, God as sustainer, God as Jaira, who is more than enough for us. God is the protagonist. And, And we are the characters in God's story that are trying to push along the story that God has been writing from the very beginning. Which means then, today, if God is the true protagonist, then who, in fact, is the love interest in this particular story? Well, it's David. David, in this moment, is God's love interest. And then if we read the story again, David's whole story, the good and the bad and the beautiful and the destructive, when we read it through its lens, we see that God has been chasing and pursuing David and that David has actually been pushing God's plot line along from the very beginning. We start and we go back to the very beginning, 1 Samuel 16. So Jesse sent and brought David in. He was reddish brown. He had beautiful eyes. He was good looking. And the Lord said, that's the one. Anoint him. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him right there in front of his brothers. And the Lord's spirit came over David from that point on. He's the one, that's the one that I'm going to pursue through this story. And my spirit is going to be on David From that point on, no matter what, David becomes king. David wants to build this temple. God turns the tables on David and says, no, 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 you're not to build me a temple. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do this for you. Second Samuel seven. This is what the Lord of the heavenly forces says. I took you from the pasture, from following the flock to be the leader over my people, Israel. I've been with you wherever you've gone, and I've eliminated all your enemies before you. Now I will make your name great, and I, like the name of the greatest people on earth, I'm going to provide a place for my people Israel and plant them so that they may live there and no longer be disturbed. This is God's promise to David. And he doesn't just start, stop with David. He moves to the people of Israel, and then he moves to the next generation. He says this, and the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make a dynasty for you. When the time comes for you to die and you to lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your descendants to succeed you and I will establish the kingdom. He will build a temple in my name and I will establish his royal throne forever. But I will never take away my faithful love from him like I took it away from Saul, whom I set aside in favor of you, David, your dynasty. Your kingdom will be secured forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. This is God's promise, a promise of of, of land, of a kingdom, of a dynasty, of generations and generations that will follow David. God says, you are my love interest. And no matter how stupid you are sometimes, right? No matter what you're going to do, I will be faithful. I will always keep my promises. No matter how dumb your children will be, which they were kind of dumb sometimes. 
I will remain faithful and true. And what's beautiful about that is that what do we learn? We don't learn about David. David's just like us. That story gets told again and again and again. What we learn is the faithfulness of God, the true hero that keeps loving, that keeps his promise, that keeps that abundance going. In fact, if we, if we shoot forward in the Gospels, to the Gospels, if we move forward, we see that God has kept God's promise in Matthew 1. And it goes to the genealogy of Jesus. It says, Jesse was the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been the wife of Uriah. And then it moves on to bring us to Jesus. So Jesus, the one who came to us, was from this lineage. The throne is established forever, promise comes true. But notice, it's not just David and Solomon for whom the promise is real. It's through the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba, noting that even in our brokenness, God is always faithful. Even when we fail, God will still love us and protect us and keep God's promises so that good and beauty and incarnation moments may happen even through us. God is not only faithful from David moving forward, but the truth is if we listen to that promise that God made David, that long promise of, of, of a dynasty, of a kingdom, of land, of generations and generations, that we have to go backwards from David's story and realize that, that God made that promise to other people as well. In fact, if we go all the way back to Genesis 12, to the origin of that promise, it's made to someone else, another love interest, which is Abraham. In Genesis 12, God says, I will make you a great nation. Sound familiar? And I will bless you. And I will make your name respected, right? Hear it? You hear that story again? And you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, those who curse you. I will curse all the families of the earth will be blessed because of you. You see, that promise God made to David is the, is the origin is found in the Abrahamic promise. And in between that time, by the way, in Exodus, God makes that promise to Moses as he brings people out of slavery, out of their chains, out of their oppression, out of their brokenness. He says, if you, you will be my people, I will be your God and I will move you into a land. God keeps making God's promise because God loves us. And all of those promises, you can go back even further, is the original promise made in the garden. Genesis 1. God blessed them, male and female, created in God's image, and said to them, be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and master it. Take charge of the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, and everything crawling on the ground. And then God said, I know I now give to you all the plants on the earth that yield she seeds and all the trees whose fruit produces its seeds within it. They will be your food. And that's what happened. And God saw everything he made, even those human beings. And it was what? Supremely good. See, God promises again and again and again from the very beginning of time. God's been writing a story in which God is the protagonist. God, creator, son, and spirit are the heroes, and we are the characters that get to be in this story. And God has written it so that we would live in this full, abundant relationship of love that we would be provided for, that we would be able to be stewards of this land, that we would have generations that follow, that they too could be a part of this relationship of promise. Because from the very beginning, God's love interest was us. You and me. God has been our, our herald trying to bring us good news of blessing and promise. God has been trying to care for us and protect us all the way through the entire story of God until that one night when in a no account town to a peasant family, God said, okay, you're still not getting how much I love you. So just let me come down in the skin of you as a baby so that, so that maybe if you could see I'm willing to depend on you, 
you will finally realize how much I love you. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but will have eternal life. And God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him, through love, through a God, a divine creator, a son and a Holy Spirit who's willing to follow along with us with all of our failures, all of our flaws, all of our ups and downs, all the times that we run away and still pursue us in relentless, reckless, graceful love. And what's beautiful is that there's more. Because there's a promise at the end of the written story, just the written story, in Revelations 22, that says, you know what? And even in the end, even between all those letters that Paul wrote (laughs) until the end of time, even through the story that the church has been writing for the last few centuries, where the church has gotten it miserably wrong, by the way, even through wars and tyranny and empire, even through pandemics, in the end, the story that will be written is that I will fulfill my promise because I will come to you. Listen to this. Then John, or the Gospel of Revelation writes, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the former heaven and the former earth had passed away. The sea was no more. I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem. So get it, a new land, right? Coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice on the throne say, look, God is dwelling, is here with humankind. God will dwell with them and they will be God's peoples. Sound familiar? God himself will be with them as their God and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. There will be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And then the one seated on the throne said, look, I am making all things new. I will be their God and they will be my children. Do you hear this good news and promise? The good news and the promise is that you and I are God's holy love interests. That in the end, when all of this is said and done, God is going to come down and establish God's kingdom that we're trying to reveal in in, in between among us, promising that no matter how bad things are, no matter how much you mourn and how much you cry and how much we fail as a people, in the end, God will restore it all and we will have a new land, a new blessing, a new generation that will live in the fullness and the abundance of relationship. And here's the thing, in between now and then, you write the story. You and I write the story. The beautiful, romantic story of sacred love is being written by your hand, by your life, by your response to this incredible gift God has given you. So in the end, what is your life going to say? You, your face, is on God's superlative page under love interest. How is your life going to write a story that says that you've been responding in every single possible way to say yes to being the love interest of God? When people look at your story and see all the characters in it, how many pages will you be on in God's yearbook? How will you live in such a way that everyone will look and say, they were so loved by God that God became their number one love interest. The promise of this all is not about David, it's about you. It's about me. 
It's a promise that we are known, ridiculously loved. So what are we going to do about that? words like ridiculous in you. (laughs) Because when we look at our lives, it is ridiculous that you would just keep up with us. It's ridiculous that you would make us and we would be your love interest and that you would give us free will to choose. It's ridiculous that we would keep choosing otherwise. It's ridiculous that you would give us so many chances to respond with grace. And yet, that's your story. It's the story you've written from the beginning of time. And it's the story that you even give us the ending to. an ending where your kingdom will be with among us, where there will be no more weeping or mourning. You give us the end. (laughs) And when we still turn away, you love us anyway. It's almost frightening. And yet, it's this gift, this free gift of love and grace. And so in this time of worship, Lord, we surrender our hearts to you. 
We ask that you impact us deep within our souls, deep within all the dark spaces that we, that we try to keep from you, deep within the closet doors where we try to hide away things we'd like to store for ourselves. And we ask you and your love to just rip it all open <laughs> so that we can respond with a resounding yes back to you. May we see the gift that you have given us to write a story where you can be the hero. We don't have to be. It's not on our shoulders. And may we let our lives be like pen to paper so that we can live in a full response of, yes, I love you back. And I will do everything to show the world that in response to your ridiculous love, I will be your love interest. Thank you for for staying with us when we cause conflicts. Thank you for involving us in this incredible relationship triangle of, of creator, son, and spirit and putting us in the center of it all. Thank you for your love and your grace. And may we find ways, Lord, to respond with our very, very lives, not just in this place, but the minute we leave the store and for the rest of our days. We ask this in your love. Amen. So one of the ways that we do respond is by finding a community of faith where we can learn the story and we can live together in that story, trying to wrestle with who God is and, and how we're characters in God's stories and where we can, we can love God fully in worship in order to be able to go and lead our lives in ways where Jesus and God's kingdom that is, is promised is revealed in small ways and in large ways. It's by saying, yes, that this is the place. St. Luke's is a place where God has brought us for whatever reason. Sometimes because we've, we, we found it through theater or through soccer. And sometimes because it's been the place where we've been rejected by other church. And somehow God's love accepts us and lets us live our lives in this church as leaders. However we've come, we've said, yes, Holy Spirit, I want to partner with you and St. Luke's to lead my life with them in ministry to you. And we do that through joining as members or partners, as we call it. Today, we have 18 new partners that have come from all different ways. <laughs> partners who are joining across the venues, partners who um, are leading their lives already um, in some major kingdom ways and partners who are coming from transferring from other churches, a few of them, but also because they've retired as Methodist pastors. <laughs> and some of them have been away from the church because they've been harmed and they're reaffirming their faith right here and accepting God's love again. And some of them are coming to publicly confess and profess their faith and their trust in this church of God for the first time ever. And that is something that we say hallelujah to. So I want to invite together Emily Young. Come on up and join Jad at the front of the stage. And Tamara and Mark Niederman, Kimberly and Jared Dunn, Harris Kohler and Joe D'Ambrosi. David Boyer and Rhonda Stanick, and Lisa Williams, who actually joined with us last week, and we have her photo to show you. In the other service, Peggy Harris is joining, Sherry and Rick Stout, Sarah Cotton and her son Camden, who's being baptized today, David and Wanda Brown. So welcome to all of our newest members. questions, these important questions that are part of uh, our partnership. And so I'll, I'll come over here and, and ask you, on behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, uh, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, you say, I do. I do. do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? I, if so, I do. And you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. If so, you say, I do. And then there's the questions of membership, of partnership. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church, right? The, the church universal and serve as Christ's representatives in this world. If so, you say, I will. 
And as members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, you say, I will. And then now for this congregation. As members of this congregation, St. Luke's, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, you say, I will. Wonderful. Now, as you all know, St. Luke's here and, and, and virtually, this is a covenant we renew with each other together. And so, members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and to your care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. And you respond with, with God's help. We were beautiful words that are not on the screen. Oh, they're on the screen. <laughs> so let me ask this question. Are you got it? Yes, let's do that. Gracious and holy God, thank you for this covenant, whether words are on screens or not. Thank you for your relentless pursuing love that Jen most profoundly preached. May her words resonate with all of our hearts as we welcome these new partners, joining us in being a part of that relentless love you extend to us in Christ Jesus. May we all be in covenant with each other to be a part of that great work of restoring this world to your grace and mercy and love. Amen. Welcome, Amen. friends. Will you welcome our new friends? Grace and peace. Welcome to you. Welcome. 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 I'm glad your seats now. Welcome. Welcome. This, this new class of partners, they have incredible stories, incredible stories, and they are going to bring so many gifts to us. And remember, every time new people come in, God and God's Holy Spirit rearranges what our mission and vision is because they have gifts that will help us to do new things, to reach new people, to, to fill in the gaps in new ways. And so may we be marveled at how God's Spirit, again, calls us, creates us, gifts us, and empowers us to reveal the kingdom until the promise is made. Now will you stand and let's sing our closing song, Child of Love. Chasing the high life Trying to satisfy my soul All the lies I believed in Left me crying
And don't let anybody else tell you the contrary. You are loved! Uh, <laughs> welcome back, Alina. <laughs> uh, before you leave today, next week we actually start a new sermon series that kind of dovetails in. It's, it's not only how you will respond, but how has been God writing your story? Not just your one story, but all your stories. How is God moving you from through and to, to continue to respond in God's love. So we want you to pick up, if you're in the space, pick up a new study guide. Tonight at 6.30, we start our Bible study with Job. Um, we're going to be looking at the book of Job and paralleling Job to Jesus, actually, and with Dr. E.B. Arnold, who is from Emory University Candler School of Theology. So we hope you'll join us. It's online. Anyone can be there at 6.30. Um, you can uh, email any of us. Join me and Jad and the other pastors as we lead that with Dr. E.B. And then listen to the podcast and we will begin that new sermon series punctuating it on Sunday. Pick up your study guide. It will help you walk through the week. You can also find it virtually online as well. Now, before I give the benediction, I want to shout out some love to Philip Hurst. It's his last Sunday with us. He and his wife are going to be moving to the beach. Philip has been playing in contemporary worship for 20 years, y'all. So lots of love, Philip. We bless you. Thank you so much for your passion and your grace. Now go from this place. If you haven't realized it enough in this worship, God loves you. <laughs> God loves you enough to send Jesus to show you what love looks like. So go from this place and may the Holy Spirit so fill you with that knowledge that your whole life between now and when we see you again is an expression of thanks for that love. May you live generously. May you live graciously. May you live love aloud as you lead your life like Jesus. And may you live in peace. Amen.